should probably uh, get started for the second session uh, of the afternoon. So again, we'll have a round table um, tonight at 7 p.m., um, which will last for two hours, at which we'll be able to uh, discuss uh, some of the issues that have come up today, and uh, no doubt some of the issues that also came up yesterday. Um, and so the you know, format of, the, of that event will be a discussion among uh, our four speakers on the weekend primarily, but also um, you know, we'll welcome lots of audience participation. Uh, so I hope that um, you'll be able to return tonight. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Ray Grazier here in Mama in Zagreb, uh, where he's speaking for the first time. I've been reading Ray's work for years uh, since encountering some of his early essays in the journal Plea, and then working through his uh, quite extraordinary doctoral dissertation. Um, so it's great to finally have the opportunity uh, to meet him and to talk with him in person. Uh, Ray Brazier is Associate Professor of Philosophy at the American University of Beirut. He is the author of Nihil Unbound, Enlightenment and Extinction. Uh, and his current research involves dialectics and its limits, the metaphysics of naturalism, and the work of Wilfred Sellers. It's perhaps uncommon to refer to someone's doctoral dissertation in a conference introduction, as I just did. Um, but I'll go ahead and recommend this text anyway to anyone interested um, in Brazier's work, since for me it's been an exceptionally important text. Um, that work is a really trenchant attack on the idealist presumptions of phenomenology, and also a rigorous rethinking of the conditions of any possible naturalism or materialism pursued through engagements with the work of Gilles Deleuze, Michel Henry, Paul Churchland, Quine, uh, and most importantly, perhaps, Francois Laruelle. Uh, and indeed, Brazier's, it was largely Brazier's work which made Laruelle an important figure um, in contemporary Anglo-American philosophy. Um, and this is also true in the case of the work of Comtem de Assou, um, whose work Brazier introduced uh, to most English-speaking readers, I think, in his brilliant essay, The Enigma of Realism, um, which was published in the second volume of Collapse, uh, and whose book, After Finitude, Brazier translated it seems almost immediately after it was published in French. But the most important contribution of Ray's work thus far is certainly uh, Nihil Unbound, Enlightenment and Extinction. Um, so again, published in 2007. It's in this book that Ray's distinctive rhetorical style, uh, uncompromisingly precise, conceptually lucid, and polemically acerbic, finds a kind of perfect fit with the content of his philosophical itinerary. A reassertion of the rights of reason over phenomenological doxa and philosophy, and a reassertion, uh, a reassertion of the Enlightenment project of disenchantment. Nihil Unbound provides some of the best readings of major philosophers that I know of, taking out the work of the Churchlands, of Adorno and Horkheimer, of Mayasu, Fatiu, Deleuze, Heidegger, and Freud. And I think that the, the chapter on Deleuze is really particularly worth reading in that book. Um, but it's also a book that I think succeeded in shifting the intellectual terrain of the field into which it intervened. Uh, it made clear the link between contemporary French rationalism and realist projects in Anglo-American philosophy, um, and it also clarified the link between both of those traditions and the tradition of the Enlightenment, um, which the book, uh, I think, really brilliantly defends. Above all, Brazier's book formulates the problem of extinction more clearly than any other text I know of. Uh, he does so with a conceptual rigor and in a rhetorical style that delivers the trauma of, the pro of this problem to thought, rendering it once inescapable and unlivable. Um, and indeed, he posits sort of major claims of philosophy is the organ on of extinction in the final sentence of that book. Uh, but it's a, a passage from the prologue to Ray's book, a sentence from the prologue of that book, um, that I think might offer uh, something like a kind of slogan for this entire conference, and so I'll close with that. Um, in the prologue of that text, Razier writes, thinking has interests that do not coincide with those of living. Indeed, the former can and have been pitted against the latter. So help me in welcoming Ray Razier. So today I'm going to talk about, uh, my talk is going to carry on some themes from uh, Martin's talk because uh, I'm going to start off by um, talking about Bergson and um, what Bergson means by um, 
experience and the, the experience of duration specifically. And um, um, what I want to do now, so first of all, um, the paper has, um, there, there's, um, when I started this paper, I thought it was going to be more straightforward than it actually turned out to be because it seemed that if any philosopher was guilty of kind of um, you know, buying into the myth of the given wholesale, you know, hook, line, and sinker, it's Bergson. Um, Bergson um, seems to kind of valorize um, intuition over intellection, the immediate sensation of experience, and he attributes, um, in fact, he says that kind of intuition itself provides the key. Um, to to metaphysics, okay, and um, I'm going to criticize. I'm going to suggest that Bergson is enthralled to the myth of the given, but actually, um, because Bergson is an extremely sophisticated thinker, um, and because he reinvents terms like um, intuition, conception, and experience, and, and the, the domain of empirical experience in particular, um, one has to be careful to kind of uh, one can't simply um, tag a straightforward kind of dismiss him or kind of uh, uh, castigate him for his kind of uh, enthusiasm for givenness in the way in which um, other kind of less um, ingenious thinkers might be. Um, so one of the things I'm going to say, the first quote actually, um, this is a quote from Bergson's Trinity of Evolution. It's, on, um, it's actually on the first page of the uh, opening of the text. It says, the existence of which we are most assured and which we know best is unquestionably our own for our, every other object we have notions which may be considered external and superficial, whereas of ourselves our perception is internal and profound. Now, what I'm going to suggest in here is that um, I'm going to challenge this basic kind of Bergsonian contention, which I think lies at the heart of this kind of... Uh, Vitalist metaphysics, insofar as vitalism is a metaphysics of experience. Um, and I'm going to suggest by introducing uh, Wilfred Sellers' critique of what he calls a myth of the given, um, that our relation to ourselves is not fundamentally different in kind from our relation to other objects. Okay, so that um, it's a mistake to assume that there's um, a categorical difference in the way in which we know about ourselves and the way in which we know about external objects and phenomena. So, um, what I'm going to outline is two contrasting concepts of experience. One, the Bergsonian pits experience against representation and insists that a new form of conceptualization is necessary to map the terrain of experience. So, this is something that's often um, the reason Bergson is ingenious is because the distinction between intellection and intuition in Bergson. Um, Bergson does not simply say, um, Bergson has a concept of intuition which entails a new theory of concept formation. Um, so in other words, his, his, kind of, uh, his critique of intellection and of uh, his denunciation of what he calls a kind of the, the intellectualist um, occlusion of the real features of lived experience or duration um, entails not simply kind of a uh, pitting intuition against conceptualization straightforwardly, but rather revising the definition of concept formation. And the philosopher, this is a promissory note in Bergson, but obviously the philosopher who has tried to kind of cash out this promissory note in most detail is, is Gilles Deleuze, who's, and if you read Bergson, I mean I've read Deleuze before Bergson, but it's apparent now, I think it's undeniable that Bergson's entire philosophical project is an attempt to systematize um, Bergson's key claims. Um, and the whole problematic of concept creation and a philosophy is conceptual creation in the laws comes from Bergson. Um, now, so, so Bergson's conception of experience um, entails that we have um, a kind of, a, there's something peculiar and specific to the character of what he calls lived experience or the experience of duration that requires new conceptual resources in order to be properly articulated. Against this, I'm going to pit a Salarsian account, a Salarsian account which is indebted to Kant and Hegel, but offers a kind of a naturalistic revision of Kant and Hegel. 
And according to the Sarajan account, um, experience is explicitly conceptual, and it's moreover, experience is a conceptual achievement through and through, even though not all experience is conceptual. So in other words, the accusation that Bergson levels against intellectualists or conceptualists, who simply believe that you can go from concepts to things, or that you can simply, that you can, uh, you can always subsume and encompass um, experiential data in terms of you know, conceptual representation um, is Bergson claims that, that you'll never get, unless you kind of install yourself in experience immediately and unless you recognize the, um, the, uh, the ways in which the qualities of experience defy conceptualization you're never going to be, uh, you're going to be a kind of idealist who fails to recognize um, the fundamental properties of the real, insofar as experience itself is the key to understanding the, the fundamental characteristics of reality. The, the, the alternative account, the, the alternative critical account I want to kind of uh, delineate is one in which the claim that experience is a conceptual achievement does not mean that all experience is conceptual. So in other words, this is a kind of a, a fallacy. Um, if you claim that um, some, um, some minimum degree of conceptualization is required in order to have an experience, that doesn't mean that the character, the intrinsic character of your experience is conceptual. So, um, now Ber so, so basically, Bergson proclaims, you know, as, as is well known by now, a, a provocative reversal of Platonism. It's not being that is degraded into appearing, but appearing that is being. It's not the sensible, the sensible is not the occlusion of the intelligible, the intelligible is the occultation of the sensible. Uh, being is not substance, but duration, only duration subsists. And this is another quote from Creative Evolution. Um, a self-sufficient reality, a self-sufficient reality is, is precisely the, the characteristic classical Aristotelian definition of, of substance, that which exists in and of itself, not through another. A self-sufficient reality is not necessarily a reality foreign to duration. We must accustom ourselves to think being directly without making a detour. Then the absolute will be revealed as very near to us and in a certain, and in a certain measure within us. It is of psychological and not of mathematical or logical essence. But do we ever think true duration? Here again, a direct taking possession is necessary. It is no use trying to approach duration. We must install ourselves within it straight away. This is what the intellect generally refuses to do, accustomed as it is to think the moving by means of the unmovable. So, um, the entire credibility of Bergson's enterprise depends on establishing the claim that the absolute is concretely given in experience and not attained via intellectual abstraction. And that, rather, that intellectual abstraction cannot provide our means of access to being. Understood, being understood as what truly is, um, what is in itself and not through another. Um, so, um, so Bergson kind of, in a way, he, he accepts a classical kind of canonical definition of the metaphysical task, but simply kind of proposes this radical redefinition of the nature of being, which is, in a way, which is like, you know, as many 19th century, you know, post kantian philosophers sought to do, which is to, you know, carry out a thorough desubstantialization of being, um, terminate the equation of being and substance. Um, so,